I've always loved the sea. It's not that I'm a sailor or anything, but growing up around the coast means I've always felt close to it. My wife and I met for our first date at the beach at Rhodesia, and after we returned from teaching abroad in the 70s, we bought our very first house right by the sea in Wales. In that house, we raised two sons, four grandchildren, five dogs, and one stray cat, all over the span of 38 years. It's been a good life. I haven't regretted a minute of it. Not even as I watched my wife struggle with her chest, and not even when I fell asleep on the sofa and awoke to find her cold in her recliner. Losing her has been the biggest struggle of my entire life. I used to tell her that life wouldn't be worth a living without her. It never even occurred to me I might have to face it. Doctors say it was a clot in her lungs, which is a bitter irony. How many years did I smoke? God, it was most of my life, and I never once saw her even look at a cigarette. The doctor said it was nothing to do with that, but it's not really the point. The point is that I smoked and drank and ate poorly, and every morning she'd wake up early and do the same exercise tape for the best part of 25 years. We even kept a VHS player, just so she wouldn't have to get a new routine. Even now, it just seems so absurd that she died first, and so young as well. I thought she'd live to be a hundred, just like a mother, but life's funny like that. After her death, I've spent the last year battling a dark cloud in my mind. My sons have worked hard to keep my head above water, making sure I do simple things like eat and bathe. I lived in a kind of fugue state for the first few months, barely registering who I was speaking to, or what I was doing. It wasn't until the girl that things changed for me. I was sitting on my bed. This was about two months after the funeral, when I heard a scream. It was about 1am I reckon. I didn't sleep much back then. But this scream, it was awful. It wasn't a panicked scream. No, it was like this agonized screeching. Just a short burst of unspeakable agony. Before I even had time to process what had happened, I was limping out into my backyard with a robe on, shouting into the wind-whipped darkness. I remember walking up to the threshold of my yard, where it opens up onto a small bit of forestry before the sandy beach, and standing there, shivering and scared. I was so scared and confused, even as I shouted over and over, Is anybody out there? Hello? The only thing I ever saw that night were the trees lit up by my torch, looking like bright white sticks of chalk against the blackboard. I kept telling myself it was just a fox, but I knew damn well what a fox sounded like, and it wasn't that. The next day, as soon as the sun rose, I went looking, walking through the woods until I made it down onto the open beach. With the tide just pulling in and the wet sand reflecting the low winter sun, it felt like standing on a plane of glass that stank of salt and decay. I quickly found a small fire pit, close up to the trees and far from the water. It's not uncommon for teenagers to come and drink and smoke around here, so I figured that maybe some kids had been hanging around that night. The only other thing around were some dead crabs, bits of driftwood, and a brain tangle of seagulls. At first, I ignored them, but as I continued to scan the horizon, I glimpsed a flash of colour between their flapping wings. I hurried over and kicked them all away. 
They'd been fighting over her. It was awful. I knew instantly it was the person who'd screamed. She couldn't have been much older than 13, I reckon. Although the police won't say for sure, because they're still not sure who she actually is. It's just something about the backpack. It looked the sort of thing a younger girl might have. She was probably invited along by an older boy and snuck out without her parents knowing. They do it all the time. Hell, I did. Sometimes, when I have nightmares, I still see that seaweed-covered pile of ribbon-like flesh. My eldest son gave me a bit of row for going down there on my own, but the police thanked me for calling them. For weeks afterwards, that girl's death haunted me. I couldn't stop thinking about it. I just couldn't get it out of my head. I called the police every day for a week, hoping to hear some updates, but they never gave me anything. It's not that I was hoping for good news. I knew better than to expect good news. But some answers, maybe. I hoped to find some answers. And yet, nothing ever came. At least, not from there. What I did then was to start waiting in my backyard each night. I kind of hoped I might see something. A part of me deep down, deep, deep down, hoped I might be able to stop whatever had hurt her and martyr myself in the process. After a few weeks of nothing but wind, I started walking the beach each morning, worried I might find another victim. I felt like I was the only one who even really cared. I know that's not true, but in that house, all on my own, I felt like I was the only one even trying to stop it happening again. It was during one of those walks I first saw the line. I didn't recognize it for what it was. No, it just looked like seaweed. A plump piece of seaweed that lay on the wet sandy shore like half-chewed licorice, while a black stalk as thin as my wrist ran all the way into the sea. I stared at it for a bit, horrified by the smell and the way it seemed to writhe and bubble in the open air. I thought it might have been some strange, unseen animal. I was set to ignore it, but something about the pustule-covered oily surface piqued my curiosity so badly that I grabbed a nearby stick and poked it. I wasn't prepared for what happened next. I don't think anyone could be. The mass just... disappeared. At first, I heard a loud twang, and then a splash. Then I felt a breeze around my face. And then, I was just looking at a crater in the sand. But I cannot emphasize just how quick this thing was. By the time my brain had even registered the thing's absence, it was long gone. I didn't even see it move. It just disappeared. It was like someone had edited a camera to make it disappear from one frame to the next. At first, I sort of just suppressed the strange experience. I thought it was unrelated to everything, and I wasn't in a very good place mentally. So, I just sort of forgot it. I was still hoping I might find out what happened to that girl, and as far as I was concerned, that thing was probably just a weird fish. Except the next day, I went for my morning walk, and it was back. This time, there were some feathers sticking out of it. Up close to it, I saw them mangled, half a life body of a seagull. It looked awful. The bird was squawking over and over, and the brutal, half-broken flapping of its wing made a terrible racket. 
I didn't know exactly what had happened to it. I suspected it may have become trapped. Maybe when it was looking for some food. I've always had a policy of being kind to animals. So I bent down to pull it out. And... There was the sound of something going taut. The thronging of a rope. And then a crack. And then a whoosh. And then... I was looking at nothing. It was so utterly bizarre and shocking, I didn't even react at first. I just stood there, trying to process what I'd seen. I decided afterwards that maybe it wasn't so good for me to go walking the beach during the morning. I half suspected I was going a bit mad. A few weeks passed after that. The girl was what occupied my mind during that time. I was happy to have a distraction from the death of my wife, and in some ways I thought that, by worrying over this poor dead child, I was doing something nobler than just looking after myself. It remained like that for quite some time, until one day I woke up and looked outside to find my bins thrown around the garden. This sort of thing can happen now and again, of course, what with foxes being quite common. But foxes don't normally move the heavy wheelie bins. It would have been a struggle for me to drag them that far, let alone an animal. Going downstairs, I saw all my rubbish thrown around, and initially my heart sank at the thought of having to clean it up. But... As I approached one bin that had snagged on a bush, I suddenly noticed that it wasn't actually a bin at all. It was the seaweed again. The way the plastic rubbish was dotted around and through it, and the way it looked so shiny and strange. Well, it looked very much like a bin bag. It was. Well, it was convincing. And that's what made me stop. That's what made me scared. There was even a clump of black seaweed at the very top, shaped just like a tiny knot. Exactly the kind of knot you'd tie at the top of a bin bag. And the way it was nestled in the bush meant that you had to look quite hard to see the twisted stalk trailing off into the woods. I couldn't understand it. It was terrifying because nothing was making any sense. But I was pretty sure that this thing, whatever it was, well, it was trying to trick me. And not just in a way that a moth might trick a spider with camouflage. No, this felt like a very clever trick. For a moment, I actually reached down, ready to give it a quick poke and see what happened. When I heard a creak. It sounded like rope under tension, a wood being stood on. It sounded like something winding up in anticipation. I hesitated and then just decided to leave it alone and back away. Something about the thing changed when I stopped bending down and moved away. It suddenly began to throb. It looked a little bit like it had been holding its breath to stay still. By the time I walked up the stairs, I looked out the window and saw that it was already gone. It was a few days before I saw it again. Enough time had passed that I'd managed to try and forget at least a little bit of what had happened. I'd spent all day watching TV just like I do every day, and then fallen asleep in the living room chair. When I woke up, the window was open and the lights were off. I could feel the draft. It felt sharp and cold, and my knees ached from where the blanket had slid down onto the floor. I wiped my face of drool and checked my watch, seeing that it was 2am. I was groggy at this stage, thinking that 
it was a little unusual that I turned the lights off. Still, my wife had always kept a lamp beside a chair to help her read, and I reached over to turn it on, when I heard a subtle creak. I froze and looked across. It was there. It was smaller this time, probably to help it fit through the window. But it was there. It was bunched around the lamp, steady and waiting. If it wasn't for the moonlight pouring into the living room window, I never would have seen it. That slick, black flesh disappeared utterly into the shadow. Looking around, I saw the twisted black stalk, as thin as my arm, trailing across my living room floor and up through the open window. I stood up, shaking with fear, and I went and turned the light on, noticing the strange, black purple residue that was left on the switch. That same residue now soaked my carpet, filling my living room with a stench of rotting fish and strange salty air. Once again, that strange mass had started throbbing once I moved away, looking like it had relaxed its dreadful ruse. I grabbed a nearby newspaper and in anger I walked over and hit it. I don't know exactly what I expected, but the speed of the thing. The living room window was practically torn out of the wall. The air rushed in as if displaced from an explosion and my rug had friction burns. Actual burns charred into the fiber from where this thing had moved so fast it had damn near ignited the nylon. And the newspaper I'd held? It had been snatched out of my hands so fast my skin was left bloodied and my wrist was sore for days. But what worried me the most, even in that moment, was the sense that it had actively tried to grab me. My eyes had barely registered it, but I swore I saw that thing clamp onto the newspaper with flammy tendrils. If it wasn't for the fact I'd used the random object, it would have succeeded. After that, I couldn't get the idea out of my head. It was a law. It was a goddamn fishing law. It was a smart, sophisticated fishing law, and it was trying to drag me into the damn sea. What the hell for? I couldn't imagine. But I had a good guess that when it was done with me, it wouldn't be throwing me back. I became paranoid pretty quickly. I started carrying a flashlight with me at all times, and I never left my windows open. But there was this horrible sense. You see, I knew nothing about this thing, but it had known enough about me to switch off the light and then set the lamp up as my lure. I started double checking every little thing. Would it rig the toilet paper for one of my many midnight bathroom trips? Would it rig the very rug I walked on to get to the light? What about my bed? My pillows? My clothes? How often do you wake up, groggy-eyed and barely sentient, and shamble into your morning routine? It wasn't just the fear. It was the false positives. It was the way I'd scold myself if I grabbed something without looking. It was the way I'd live in constant fear of messing up all over again. I made sure I knew just how much luck had saved my skin up until that point, and I kept telling myself my luck would not hold for much longer. That's not a healthy way to live, by the way. It's actually quite exhausting. I just kept hoping it would somehow end, and as the weeks passed, I started to hope that maybe the law had left me alone, finding me a little too smart. Looking back, 
that's quite a laughable idea. If anything, I had drastically underestimated the law. You see, I'd always had a fondness for cats. My wife had preferred dogs, and while I loved all animals, I'd grown up with cats, and I liked their company a lot, and secretly, I'd always wished we could have had more. It was late one night, when I heard a strained meow coming from just beyond my window. It was a stormy night, and you could hear the sea battering the distant cliffs. I ignored it at first, because it's so typical for cats around here to fight and cry. But the sound kept coming. Sitting here, listening to this creature in pain, I couldn't help but get to thinking. Wouldn't it be nice if I had a cat in my old age? I could find one and help it and call the vet in the morning and then the cat would maybe stick around. I had images of a little ginger tabby cat sauntering around the kitchen as I potted about. God, I was being so stupid. I rushed outside and followed the noise. It was almost regular, like a church organ. When I traced it, I found the tail's back end sticking out of a bush. It looked a little like it was struggling, almost like it had become stuck. I was so wound up, so broken from a lack of sleep and distressed by the sound of pain that I came so close, mere inches away from touching the orange fur. But something within me told me otherwise. In the moment, I hated it. I hated that thought. I so badly wanted to help another living thing that I secretly loathed this part of me that suggested that maybe, just maybe, it was all part of the law. I took a deep breath and pulled back the brushes, and what I saw horrified me. It hadn't even found a living cat, or if it had, it certainly hadn't let it live for long. You see, this thing, this amorphous, tendril-wielding lump of tobacco spit come to life, had driven long knuckled fingers that looked like grotesque spider legs deep into the belly of this cat. Before my very eyes, I saw those fingers spread the cat's ribs and then squeeze them shut, pushing a withering and unnatural cry out of the animal's mouth as it did so. It was like some twisted, hellish version of a bagpipe. I fell backwards and screamed. The very sight made me want to vomit. I couldn't bear it. I was so angry, I wanted to grab that damn law and yank whatever the hell was in that ocean out to meet me and face my wrath. It took every ounce of my willpower to stop myself. That's what made it so clever. It knew. It knew exactly how to push my buttons. It wasn't about tricking me that time. It was about goading me. It took every bit of strength to hold myself back. But in anger, I stood and screamed at it. Go away! Just leave me the hell alone! With that, the cat's body suddenly slumped and fell down. When I looked in the bush once more, there was no sign of the law. It had gone, leaving me with a poor animal's body. I buried it in that night, sobbing the whole time. The next morning, I called my son and asked him to take me to a home, one that's far away from the sea. Since then, I've just been waiting. I've been ready to go for days. I don't want to take anything with me. It hurts just to look at it now. 
All I wanted to do was leave. I thought that maybe, if I got far away... But like always, I just keep underestimating the law. I thought that my son would be coming this morning. He was supposed to. He rang at midday, a good few hours after he was expected. He was hysterical. He kept saying that no one could understand why. No one knew why. Why what? I'd asked. Why they dig her up, Dad? Why would anyone take her body? And now, it's night time. It's night, and my head is hurting, and I'm afraid. I'm afraid of what's upstairs. I'm afraid of the sound of smashing glass that I heard an hour ago, and the strange, dreadful thumping that followed it. I'm most afraid, because when I went upstairs to check on what had happened, nothing looked different. It was the most normal thing in the world, a sight I've seen a thousand times. My bedroom, the lampshade on, my slippers ready, and worst of all, the duvet-covered shape of my wife, her chest rising and falling 